get started. I kind of want to hang out We're live. We can back yeah. here. I'll let you say your name, unless you want me to introduce you to. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <sighs> okay. Yep. Got a few people coming. All right, everybody. Uh, let's get started. See a couple people coming in. Uh, now, I just want you to know you don't have to take pictures of these slides because they are all available on the internet right now for download. Or, of course, this session is being recorded, so you can watch it later. I'm Doug Soltes. I work with SwiftStack. Uh, this is Clay Girard. He's one of the core Swift developers. And uh, today, we're going to advance you further into the Swift realm. So this is Swift 102 beyond CRUD. Now, we've got a quick agenda. And uh, today, this conflicts a little bit with Summit. And so normally, if you've seen our previous talks, we do a bunch about Swift API. There's certainly going to be Swift API in here. But we decided we'd throw in a little bit for operators. There's a lot of new stuff in the uh, Mintaka release 2.7. Yeah. Yeah. Clay's going to be talking to that. And uh, in case you have not seen us talk before, and all this stuff is too new and too complex or, or whatever, well, guess what? All the OpenStack videos are available online. Clay and I have spoken before in uh, Tokyo. We've spoken in Vancouver, um, yeah. Paris, and other summits, yeah. um, as well as other people in the community. So uh, Christian has spoken. He's uh, given you how to build Swift web apps, how to build Swift middleware. And so if you need any getting up to speed, this is the best way to do it. So without further ado, I'm going to let Clay take it over and talk about uh, what's there's, new for operators. There's been some new uh, talks given this summit as well. So yeah, when we well, do this again in Barcelona, we'll have even, even more stuff. Um, yeah, so Doug and I were talking about what we want to go over um, you know, in this cycle at this summit. And um, I was looking back at what I'd been working on, uh, both upstream and Swift, and uh, at SwiftStack trying to uh, operationalize Swift for folks. And uh, I really want to talk about some operator features. Because yeah. we, we've done some stuff on the, um, the back end uh, that has done, been some good improvements. And that's what I've been working on. So that's what I want to talk about. What happened there? Don't know how to use these things. I don't know. <laughs> Clay, I told you, it's just up and down, I up know. and down. It should be simple, it should be simple enough. Uh, yeah, luckily they don't let me run slides in my day job. I just work on distributed storage systems. <clears throat> there we go, see if uh, the up, down, there we go. Okay. Uh, so one of the changes that we were working on, uh, there was another uh, core developer, uh, Matt Oliver, and a few of us had been talking about this idea, um, was a way that we can improve the, um, some of the operations, the speeds uh, of some operations under failure. Um, you know, Swift is, is you know, a distributed system. It you know, takes advantage of the hardware that you can give it, and it's going to be you know, a fast storage system as you need it. Um, but when things fail, uh, there's always opportunities for timeouts, and things are not going to go well. So as the storage system itself is degraded, uh, you can, you know, the, some of the clients will be observable. And it's our job, working on the system, to not only work around those failures and main, make sure that we can maintain availability, but also to optimize in those failure cases to make sure that we're still remaining as fast and, and performant as possible. So this is a new feature. It just came out in the last OpenStack release. Um, it is currently not on by default uh, for, uh, in the uh, default configuration. So as you're doing your review of the change log and getting prepared to deploy your Swift clusters, um, you know, make sure that you are going and enabling that. Uh, in SwiftStack, we did some internal testing. And on all of our new clusters going forward, we have some numbers based off work that Doug has done that we're, we're, we're going to be you know, having this on uh, going forward because it is an awesome optimization. Uh, but if you need to turn it on, it's just a couple of config options. Uh, and the goal is to improve first byte latencies uh, under failure. So let's look at a little bit how that works. Uh, and again, I apologize. I'm going to get down into the weeds because I've been thinking about this stuff for the past release. Now, this is a nice, good failure condition. In, in distributed systems, high available systems, we love to think about when things are really broken. So here we have a triple replicated system. Uh, there's three primary nodes that are holding this object data. And in the first two attempts to reach that data, uh, the node 
timed out. This is, in, in, you know, we'll think of it as some sort of error. It wasn't a quick response where uh, the drive had been unmounted uh, or some of the, one of the other operational monitoring procedures had sort of marked that offline. This has been a discovered failure that just sort of just happened. Network congestion, uh, there's some sort of uh, disk I.O. that's hammering that particular device. And so from the proxy that's organizing all of these object servers and talking to them, when it goes to make a request to one of the nodes, it can't wait forever for that guy. It doesn't understand, you know, we don't know what's going on with that guy's uh, disk write queue depth or whatever. So if that node doesn't respond, we're going to time that out and move on to the next one. So here we've got a real good failure. After that, the second node was also failed. So finally, we, we fail over to the third. And in his situation, it was a very quick, short response. He was able to respond, and then we can return to the client. So we're working around all these failures, but the client can observe this. This is latency on the order of seconds, potentially, and uh, it can be observable. So with concurrent gets equals true, we take a very similar sort of failure mode. We have a couple of nodes that are uh, timing out, you know, just we can't wait on them any longer. But what we do is we stagger when we start the request, this little waterfall of when we push out the requests. So even though we haven't given up on that first request, it may yet still come back. We're going to sort of precede the request queue a little bit and send out another request, you know, now after a little bit, you know, and see just sort of hedging our bet that maybe that second node is going to be coming back. So in the same failure condition, we've actually lowered the time to first byte that the client improves by 2x. So this is, this, is, this is sort of a perfect storm that this particular situation is, in some respect, what it was built for. But when we were implementing this feature and, and thinking about how we can leverage concurrent gits, we started thinking about all the different kinds of failure modes that we might be seeing. So taking a very similar setting, uh, you've turned on concurrent gits true, you have a uh, sort of few hundred millisecond sort of waterfall request pattern. If you have a little bit different failure mode, where the first node times out, the second node is slow. It's still going to, you know, there's still going to be, you know, some, some difference in time, but um, that second node is, is going to be slow. Eventually, we get back the response, but we haven't gotten it back before the time whenever we um, wanted to, again, kind of hedging our bets, send out that next request. So, you know, the interesting thing that you see here is that we respond as soon as we get back a, that first successful request. The third request that actually gets sent out, that's going to end up, you know, piling into the disk queue and doing that read. From the object server's perspective, it needs to service this request. It just doesn't happen as fast, you know, any faster than the other node that got started a little bit ahead of it. So in some ways, you can think of this as uh, useless I.O. It's not perfect in efficiency, uh, but not having um, the ability to see into the future, it is sort of perfect in implementation. Well you know, as good as we can do. Um, so here's a different failure mode. This is a great one. We have total primary storage failure. So this is something where, you know, you might see under a cluster, we're going to talk about these a little bit later, we've got disks getting full, we've had a massive partition in the network, and um, none of the primary storage devices for an object are down. These are typically going to be in separate zones. Uh, so this is some sort of systemic failure going on in the cluster. Very exciting stuff. We, you know, we're going to do our waterfall pattern, and we're going to hedge those bets, uh, getting out all of those uh, requests. Uh, and then we're going to go to a handoff node. If this is a new write coming in, and the previous write had also observed a similar sort of failure pattern, it wouldn't have been able to write to the primary nodes, and it would have written that data into a handoff location, which the consistency engine would repair later. So there's still a good shot that you know, we can find the data that we're looking for on one of the handoff nodes. So we, there's, a, there's a number of requests up to 2x your replicate count that we'll sort of dig around into the cluster to find a viable disk that we can write to for writes, or uh, potentially based off this stable ordering, assuming that a write may have come in through that uh, sort of de degraded state, we can find it in the way that it goes. So we hold off on the last request. We, we never have more than replica count requests in the queue. Uh, so it's not a perfect waterfall. You don't see immediately after you know, your concurrency timeout setting of that third request that the next one gets started immediately. We actually want to wait until one of those kind of falls back into the queue so that we never have too many outstanding requests, uh, because this is a pretty exceptional situation where you have a total primary failure. Uh, and we'll look at some of the other cases here, and you can see a little bit why this makes sense. We already talked about that extra request when you already end up serving the one that you started earlier can be a little bit of wasted I.O. 
Uh, so this is concurrent gets true. Uh, the timeout's a little bit smaller. It's a tunable, so you can kind of shape that waterfall pattern based off of your average time to first bite, your 95th percentiles. Uh, Doug's going to look into a little bit of that. Uh, so we have some slow responses, and we don't start, that fourth request doesn't get started right there along that waterfall. It would not happen in this case because the second request that we started was able to get served. So there's no extra pending I.O. that, that it most of the time is not going to be useful. Um, and you know, here's another similar situation where a concurrency timeout is very low. We're firing out multiple concurrent requests. This can introduce some extra I.O. into your cluster. This is not uh, the default. It's just meant to be an example. Uh, but if you shoot them all three basically out at the same time, the first one to respond is going to be the one that we come back with. But we never have, it doesn't just keep going out through all that 2x replicate count into all the handoffs. We'll never have more than your replicate count uh, requests pending at a time. And this is, this is some of the, the work that we did as we were working on this object and uh, working on this new feature and figuring out how to, how to make it work best for folks. Yes, yeah, so I'd be glad to talk about this. So we ran a bunch of benchmarks in our lab. So it doesn't have to be that you're using this for a node or a drive that's failed. This can actually accelerate your workloads. And so let's talk about the workload that we ran. We ran through SSBench, and we had a workload where we have small objects and we have large objects. And it's a very common workload that we see when we're speaking genomics or media and entertainment, right? You have all these little models, and and then you render it into a big frame. Or you have all these little ACTG groups and you render that into a big genome. And what's happening is that when I'm writing those big files or when I'm reading those big files, my tiny request, my, my small request, can get queued up behind that on a drive. And this is a perfect case to, in a healthy cluster, speed up your um, your, your, your first time to bite with your quality um, of service. Yeah, with your searches. And so our tiny objects are 4K to 32K in this example. Our big objects are 50 megs to 128 megs. Uh, we did 90% uh, tiny objects, 10% large objects. And within tiny objects and large objects, we were doing 50 50 read write. And so here's what this looks like with concurrent time offs off the way that you'd have it in Swift 2.6, uh, we're seeing that on a tiny object, on average, we're getting about 174 milliseconds. So again, this is a small cluster. It's three nodes, 12 drives per node, something you'd see kind of typically as a, a, a small Swift deploy. And so we're, we're hammering it. I think I was doing 150. It was in my SS bench on the previous slide. Uh, 150 concurrent uh, requests, trying to hit it as fast as we can. And we're getting an average time out of 174 milliseconds, our 95th percentile, right? So if you're looking at the, the worst results, we're Outliers, getting, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're getting uh, 698 milliseconds. And so uh, once we turned this on, the first thing I did was I set it to 200 milliseconds. So again, if I'm queued up for more than 200 milliseconds, it does that concurrent firing. And you can see I got a 74% improvement in my average, and I get 134% improvement in my worst cases. And if you reduce this all the way down to zero milliseconds, where it's firing all the requests simultaneously, which I think is a bad idea, we'll talk about that in a second, um, the benefit just gets better and better and better. The reason I'm going to say that asterisks here do not set this below, or I would not recommend you set this below 50 milliseconds, is because the I.O., right? So I had 36 drives, and when I set that that low, I'm doing all these, as Clay called them, useless requests. And I actually started getting a couple of errors on the drives where my request queue, these were SATA drives, were getting a little too long. I think during that zero millisecond run, I got nine um, request timeouts, 503s, right? And that's not something you want to see in a healthy cluster. So if you're going to play with this in a cluster, you know, start high, 200 milliseconds, go down to 100 milliseconds, work it that way. And the other interesting thing here is it even helped the first bytes for large objects. So when you think about a large object, there is a statistical case where a large object is going to get queued up behind another large object, and it helps with that too. Now, if you ask, hey, Doug, why do you have in this chart the tiny object's last byte latency and the big object's first byte latency? It's because, honestly, there's about one millisecond difference with a small object between first and last byte latency, so you might as well leave it the same. Here's the same thing as a graph. And so if you look at that red and orange line, that's my 95th percentile for the large objects 
and for the tiny objects. The two lines at the bottom are my average latency for the small and large objects. And you can see you get a big benefit even just turning it on, so to 200 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And then you really get diminishing returns up to, to zero milliseconds, which is why I'm really going to advocate that you don't blow up a production cluster and yeah. set it at zero right off but the bat. I, I, I really like this graph because it sort of validates when we were working on it and we were working through these, these uh, situations and trying it out in, in various lab and dev environments. Uh, this is exactly what we wanted to see. We understood that there was a range here and that it was, there were some trade-offs. And so that, that diminishing returns graph is exactly what we were expecting with and dealing with. So I'm really glad that it worked out and Doug did all it the, did? the hard work. Well, you programmed it, so. Um, okay, well, so that was concurrent gets. Turn it on, it's faster, it's great. Uh, I want to talk about uh, another uh, operational thing that uh, I've been working on. Um, I don't know, failures is, uh, is still an interesting thing. Uh, and in this particular case, I want to talk about a specific failure, the 507. Uh, I've been involved uh, over this last cycle in a number of engagements, it feels like, where their growth curves look like this. Uh, everything is going great, we're growing, we're adding data to the cluster, uh, they've got new use cases coming on from internal partners and stuff that, that want to transfer uh, expensive, uh, off of expensive storage onto the Swift storage, API-based commodity storage. And suddenly, uh, someone in some internal team finds, man, this is working really well, I want to go backfill a bunch of old data, or I want to start applying this to new applications, and all of a sudden the growth curve, because it's just API storage, it feels like it's infinite, unless you're the guy operating the cluster, and then you actually have to plan for these capacities. Capacities. So <laughs> you, everyone can sort of imagine exactly what happens uh, in the next few ticks on this graph. And, uh, but what you may not uh, necessarily want to ever have first-hand experience with is what happens if uh, that growth curve does outpace your ability to um, manage your cluster and bring in new nodes and plan for that capacity and get them online. So I'm going to talk a little bit sort of through the process what happens when Swift runs out of storage. Uh, so first of all, the object server, in attempting to write down a object to the disk, if there's not enough space to write that disk, uh, to write that data to the disk, it returns immediately a 507 HTTP status response to the proxy, uh, which the proxy will observe, uh, and it will error limit that uh, particular device, and it won't try to perform future writes to it. So back when we were talking about that primary storage failure, one way that you could get into that case where new objects are being written entirely on handoff nodes instead of on their primary nodes is if all of the primary disks are full. Uh, but Swift will you know, dig through up to you know, two extra replica count, all these handoffs, and it works its way around the ring and every place that the partition could be placed in this stable pattern until it finds somewhere to store this disk. It will dig around for every last byte that it can possibly find so that it can write down that data and service that request. Swift is a system of turning disk space into HTTP 201 created status calls. Uh, it won't give up uh, until it absolutely can't go on any further. Um, but one of the interesting artifacts that comes out not in the right path, but once you start observing these 507s, which can get returned all the way out to the client. The client, it could observe a 507 storage space not available because the cluster, the proxy, despite its best effort, cannot find anywhere else that it can fit these bytes. Uh, so then you're sort of left in this situation. Well, what do I do? What do I do about these 507s? So one of the first things a lot of people want to think is, okay, I want to send a delete. I've got some old data, uh, some test data, and I want to delete that. Um, but uh, people talked about distributed systems doing deletes is sometimes harder than doing writes. Uh, and the way that you know, Swift has to implement that is be like a, really it's a kind of a transaction. We have to write down that you wanted to delete this object. So uh, particularly in the place where things are you know, perhaps under failure mode, we've got devices in different places, we still have to record that delete operation. And in Swift that's implemented as a tombstone, a zero byte file marker that'll get uh, written down to indicate the object was deleted and sometime after your consistency engine runs, that as well can get reaped. But these tombstone objects can get written onto handoff nodes, not on the primary locations. And generally, in, you know, if you think about down on the data structure, first we have to write down that it needs to be deleted, and then we can unlink the fat data file that actually has you know, hundreds of megabytes of objects in it. So you have to write first, and then you can unlink and, and free up storage space. But in a situation where the primary data holder is over here, but he can't be written to because he's out of space, the tombstones could actually end up getting recorded onto another device, which will have to be replicated over, again it's a write, before it can get deleted. So a delete request may just create zero byte files and not actually remove anything from the, the cluster. Uh, and of course, while all this is going on, you know, replication is actively trying to repair this and, and any handoffs, any data that's been written out of place is going to be trying to get moved back to the, the primary modes, uh, the primary devices where it's supposed to be stored. So Swift is 
doing what it's supposed to be doing, but as an operator, when you're in this situation, you, you really are trying to figure out, okay, I need, to, I need to come up with a better plan. I gotta do something to actually deal with this situation. And Swift provides a number of tools to operators so that they can make uh, a cluster full situation, hope you never get into it, uh, be essentially a non-issue. So I talked about those clients getting those 507s. When you call the operator and say, hey, I got a 507, that is either a very calm conversation uh, where he says, it's no problem, I'll have the new drives on later this afternoon and I'll enable merge your replication mode, or or you can delete some old data, or it's, you know, their hair is on fire and they're, they're freaking out because maybe they don't, they're not aware of, of, of all the things you kind of got to put together to, to make the system uh, work in a healthy mode. So here's some, here's some stuff that you got to think about. Uh, first tool that we have available is Fallocate Reserve, F Allocate Reserve. Uh, and basically this just says that during a write, I talked about how if there's not enough space to store that object, it will return 507 to the proxy. Uh, F allocate reserve allows you to say, I wanna hold on to some additional space. Give me a few hundred megs uh, in addition to uh, the space of the object. And if I don't have that plus, go ahead and return the 507. Find a different disk to put this on. Uh, this one is near full. Uh, holding a little bit back means that you will have room when a delete request comes in to write those tombstones directly over the data files on the primary locations where they're supposed to go. And that allows you to, to get things via the API to reduce some of your, your holdback storage space. Uh, another thing that uh, is a new feature uh, F allocate reserves have kind of been in there for a while, but the replication engine we talked about and we've learned and observed is, you know, it can fight against you. Uh, even if the object server allows you to write something else over here, the consistency engine is going to be wanting to put it back over here, trying to repair that failure as it observed it. So with our sync modules per disk, first of all, it's just a great tuning. It's a new way for people to kind of balance their IO so you can have per device um, concurrency count. So you can sort of tune an individual drive level rather than server level. Uh, you can tune it right to the drive so you can marry that closer to your, your queue deck. Uh, good default probably to be start at four. A lot of people have been running around 25 or so for a node, uh, but that means you could potentially have 25 connections going to a specific disk. With rsync module per disk and the uh, rsync module template that you can put in your object server config, you can tune that such that if a single device already has four other nodes in the cluster trying to push a partition onto that device, you just have to wait and come back around to it whenever the slot's available for you. Um, so it's better load balancing, you know, just to your, your disk I.O. Uh, and the advantage of having this means that you can also shut down those replicators at the per disk level. Uh, and we'll look at that in the next slide. Uh, the next thing that you need to think about is uh, emergency replication mode. Uh, there's a couple of tunables. Uh, I kind of group them together because um, you're going to be using them together a lot. Uh, when you're in a situation where uh, you really need the consistency engine to be focusing on moving new data to fill up your new nodes, uh, there's a couple of tunables that you can use to sort of indicate that this is the primary work that I want you to be doing. Uh, and it's just a couple of seconds in the object replicator setting. Um, it's, not, it's not the default though, because it does sort of, uh, uh, it d focuses work on one particular thing and the consistency engine normally has to take a larger view. Not only do I need to be moving data, I also need to be repairing durability and the uh, consistency of the processes. So disabling the rsync modules, um, you know, SwiftStack implemented this as part of our node agent that already is sort of monitoring devices and alerting you if you have devices where they're getting too full and that sort of thing. So it was easy for us to add this here. Everybody's got different ways of doing it. There's been a number of Swift operators and we've all been sort of sharing, okay, how are you guys doing it? How are you guys doing it? And you know, it's hard to be very prescriptive because everybody kind of has some of their own stuff built up. Um, but it's also nice to have examples. Uh, so go to the gist, check it out. I mean, it's just a very short Python script. You can see it sort of goes over all of your devices. It does a stat. If they um, don't have enough space that you want to, to have on them, you disable rsync. Uh, otherwise, you make sure that rsync is enabled. To disable rsync, you just write down this little template file that takes that device's um, rsync module, sets its max connections to negative one, which means that nobody can talk to that disk via rsync. Uh, and of course, if the disk is healthy or once it becomes healthy, because even though it won't be receiving rsync connections, it can still push data out via the rsync client. Uh, you want to make sure that that uh, configuration file has just been removed. You just unlink it. Just get rid of it. And if it's not there, you know, that's fine. Move on to the next guy. Uh, so not necessarily that you would be running this script. Uh, I'm sure you can come up with something more eloquent, uh, but uh, that's the general idea. Mark the rsync disk module as Mac connections never want, uh, negative one when it's full and uh, pull it back off whenever it's ready to go. Now this allows uh, sort of, you see how it all plays together. So the first step that you got to think about is a new writes coming in. 
uh, we're going to reserve some space on this full device here. So the first three are our main primaries, a user writes to the proxy, the proxy writes to the nodes. The one that's full or getting full is going to return 507, and the proxy is going to write that data down somewhere else. Uh, the next step that's going to be going on in the cluster is we're going to be trying to repair that, right? The primaries want to fix the fact that the other primary that's not holding the data should be. And we are not going to let that happen. We're going to disable those disks so that we can not, like, end up backfilling and working against ourselves. Um, because we know that what we've got coming, the real solution uh, for Swift is to add new capacity. And when this new node comes online, rebalance, partitions are going to get moved around, the emergency replication mode ensures that the primary work that the consistency engine is focusing on is pushing the data off of our full disks onto our filling disks. And that is how you can make a full cluster kind of a non-issue. Awesome. So I'll just speed through. We've got a couple Sorry. of cool new things to talk about <laughs> also. So those are definitely the best ones, the high ticket items. That's why we let Clay talk about them. So one thing that Swift has always been great at is having multi-region, right? So you have a single namespace. You've got these links, but they're highly latent. This is something that eventual consistency totally helps with. And yet we've gotten a bunch of support calls at Swift Stack where people haven't configured it right. And we want to make sure the whole community knows how to sw configure Swift correctly for multi-region. So you set up a, a region in London, Australia, and in the Americas, and the next thing you know, customers are, are calling because they're getting high latency on their puts, their gets, on everything. So the first thing is really obvious. Everybody probably already knows this. You need to set up read affinity. Read affinity says that when I come to a proxy node in my region, I should look first for an object in my region and not go across the wire. Now, of course, if it doesn't find it there because it hasn't replicated so far, it's going to go across the wire. Now, the second thing you probably already know is we should use write affinity. Write affinity is a double-edged sword because it is saying that when I write data, all three copies are going to go to the same region, and then the replicator is going to eventually move them to the other regions. Again, read affinity would still be able to access that if you're accessing it from another region where it hasn't replicated to yet. However, with write affinity, you do have to worry because right now, for this small moment in time, I have all three copies in one region, and if that region you know, fell off the face of the earth, I don't have the same durability I normally have in Swift. But what you probably don't know are the next two settings, and some of these came out in the Tokyo release, and we didn't have time to talk about them. So uh, you, you set up read affinity, you set up write affinity, and users are, are working, and, and they're much happier now. But every once in a while, you get a user coming, and they're going, hey, my connections are still really latent. Why? On every put, get, et cetera. Well, when you think about it, the way we authenticate in OpenStack is with tokens. And tokens are stored in Swift to cache and speed things up. And that's in a memcache pool. And if you have your memcache pool across all these regions, there's a chance that I'm sitting in London and my token is being cached in Australia. And that's not a very good thing. And so what you want to do is you want to start taking your proxy servers. You want to alter your uh, proxyserver.conf. And you want to set up the proxy server to only use memcache servers within its own region. And so now your customers are much happier. But then every once in a while, you get a customer coming to you and they go, hey, you know, I've set up storage policies. I'm writing to data, and I want it just to write to London. And it's only writing to London. My objects are just in London. I'm not using the full you know, multi-region settings. And yet, I'm still highly latent. What's going on? And here's what you have to remember. The object system is able to use storage policies. And storage policies, if you don't know, we'll talk about later. But they allow you to control the durability of your data, the geolocation of your data, and the tiering of your data. And so if you've picked the geolocation of your data to only be London, well, the account container, which is our database layer, does not abide by those storage policies. It always replicates across the entire region. And so there's a setting out there for async container updates, where essentially what happens is the database in your region gets updated, and the databases in the other regions get asynchronously updated by the object server. And so your customer is always getting that fast 200 on their puts. It really just affects you on puts mm -hmm. um, and updates. Or deletes. Or deletes. Or posts now. So there's our, our, hey, this is how do you, uh, you should make multi-region yeah. really work for you. Yeah. Uh, another quick thing that, that, Clay, you want to talk about for? Yeah, uh, so this is uh, something that we've been working on. This is another uh, long one. Uh, the post operation is something that Swift uh, provides to perform metadata updates to objects. 
that you have in the system. Uh, the original implementation just uh, notated the uh, transformation near the object, uh, down in a meta file next to the data file, um, which will allow you to override or change uh, some of the metadata that's associated with that object. It can be you know, useful if you're doing some sort of indexing and you need to keep some uh, metadata with the object. Um, but it didn't update the container listings, which one of the things, one of the pieces of metadata that they include is the content type. And since there was no update to the database layer, the container listing layer, uh, there was some pieces of metadata that you couldn't change on, on an object. Um, so later, uh, a new implementation that wanted to sort of make that a little bit more consistent uh, was to transform the post operation into a server-side copy, uh, which is exactly how S3 does metadata updates. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's cost intensive. On the server itself, it has to actually read all the bytes, uh, do any transformations that it wants to do the metadata in there, and then store it back down. So we were never really happy with this. Workloads that, uh, but post operations weren't a common thing in most workloads. But in workloads where post was an important thing, there was still a tunable, the object post is copy, which you could change it to false, and you'd fall back to the old behavior with all of its restrictions. Uh, so one of the things that we were working on in this cycle was unifying those two implementations so you get the same behaviors and expectations from the client side, you can update whatever metadata that you want on the object, but removing that side distraction of it actually being transformed into a server-side copy and therefore being slower. Uh, particularly on a large object, you might want to upload hundreds of megabytes and then just do a quick little post request to add some additional metadata to it. Now you could have sent that metadata with the object itself, but if you're calculating different kinds of checksums besides the MD5 that Swift already keeps for you, you may not want know all that information until after you've read it, and so you want to just have a little quick way to notate some information on the object after you've uploaded it. Uh, so now when you set object post as copy uh, to false in Swift 2.7, uh, you get fast post, uh, which has all of the behaviors and all of the good stuff that you get from post is copy, but with none of the bad stuff where you have to transfer a lot of bytes. It is zero I would say bad. you should use it as win, the win. default. Yeah. Use it every yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the Swift community is very leery about, uh, you know, we want operators to have time to migrate to new settings. We don't want to change or make any surprises for anyone. But this, one of the sessions that we're talking about now is, okay, how, what's our deprecation cycle? How can we get rid of post as copy? There is just no but downside. This is an absolute in, win. In, in Swift stack, you know, new clusters going forward, post is copy false. All right, so let's move our talk on a little bit to talk to the developers in the room, right? We've definitely spoken to you guys before, and we want to tell you about new updates to the Swift API. So the first one is last time, Clay and I talked about uh, ranged SLOs, and that was a whole new feature in the Swift API. One of the new things in the Swift API as well is that now by default, SLOs can allow for a one byte segment. So previously, we had this slide up here and we said, hey, why would you want to use a ranged SLO? Well, I've got three different objects. These could even be SLOs, and I want to make them into a new object, and so I can use these ranges in my, my new object. But the, the caveat was none of these ranges could be under a megabyte. Well, guess what? Now they can. Now, I do have one warning to throw out there, <laughs> and that's if you are going to use ranges under a megabyte, by default now in 2.7 Swift, we are going to rate limit that, and the rate limiting works like this. It says uh, ranges under a meg, we will only deliver one segment per second. Now, of course, your admin can change that. You can change that to deliver five a second, or you could actually set that, that minimum size from a meg down to half a meg. But I did want everybody to know that this is now yet another feature. This is actually the third time yeah. in a row that we've talked about new improvements or new features yeah. in the API for SLOs. It's, it's really been turned out to be kind of an interesting feature. You, you write these manifest objects, and it creates in a very small little blob data that really didn't exist by comprising it of other things. Right. Uh, another new thing out there, so everybody knows that Swift can list files, we can do markers, we can do things like that, and now you can do reverse listings. And so the use case for this is generally log files, right? You're putting log files in, they're segmented by date, you do a listing, and it's coming up in, in what you would think of as reverse order, and um, versioning objects. And so it's really simple, uh, when, you, when you do a, a, um, a queried parameter, you do question mark reverse equals true, and guess what? You will get your, your objects back in reverse order. Um, and if you need to know more about the query parameters Ooh. in Swift, John Dickinson, the PTL, gave a great talk uh, back in Vancouver. And if you look this up, you will learn about markers, prefixes, delimiters, and everything else you could want to do with uh, query perimeters. Now, I have a, a wag of my finger at, at a couple of the developers in the audience. Uh, 
We talked almost two years ago about SWIFT announcing storage policies. I spoke in Vancouver about how to implement that and put that, you know, query them, put them into your programming. They're an extremely powerful thing. They allow you to determine the data durability as a, as a end user or an app developer, the geolocation and the tier of drives. And I have seen very few applications on the market giving the end user, the customer, the ability to pick their storage policy. And so what's happening is it's just going to default. So back in my, my example earlier, when I talked about multiple regions, you need to expose that to the operator, to, to the end user. So if this is you know, your backup program, you're using net backup or Convolt or whatever, there needs to be that drop dropdown. Um, I, here, I took a quick uh, no, screenshot of an mm -hmm. application where mm -hmm. when you create your container, you know, it gives you an option of all the storage policies out there. And again, this must be done at, con at container creation. Mm -hmm. You cannot do this after yeah, the, the audit fact. is go through your code, find a place where you're creating a container, and think about if that could be pointed at a cluster where there's actually different reasons why they might want to use a different storage policy. And figure out a way to give that option to the user. An another thing that developers ha have hit me with a ton is been, um, gee, object storage is really slow. Like, I don't like it. I, I, I use it, and, and it's terrible. And I'm going, well, I don't think you're using it right. And so one of the things we want to make as, a, a, again, a performance um, knowledge transfer is that object storage is highly latent. And what you need to do is not treat it like a filer or a block system where I do request and then wait for that to come back in another request, another request. When I work with developers and their application runs slow, it's generally because they're doing one request at a time and there's a huge amount of latency. And so the thing you need to do with object storage is to fire off a ton of, of streams, of connections. And generally when I work with anything, I always start with 10 streams or 100 streams. Object storage is perfectly great at handling that. And that's not something you normally would do with a filer because that would be a terrible idea. And so I can show you right here that on both puts and gets, if I have a single connection, I'm, and these are 128K objects, so kind of small objects, I'm getting pretty poor performance. But doing the same thing with 100 connections is giving me a 30, 40X improvement in my speed and my transfer rate. And then if you combine that with, next slide, with larger object sizes, you get even more advantage. And so this is the same graph, right? The same information I just showed you, but instead of just having 128K objects, I'm showing the performance with two mega objects. And you can see on the right, with 100 connections transferring data, I think I was using get put as my um, benchmarking tool, two mega objects, on my Git side, I was almost maxing out a, a 10 gig pipe. And this was, again, against that small system I did the other benchmarking with, uh, three nodes, 36 drives, and, and I was limited to 10 gigs. That mm -hmm. was all my proxy had going um, you know, in mm -hmm. and out of it. The last thing I want to bring up is some best, practicing, uh, best practice around sharding. And so what's sharding? Well, I've seen a bunch of developers treat Swift as if every container is infinitely deep. And I'll tell you what, even Amazon S3, the container is not infinitely deep. They've got a, a knowledge base on there and they go, here's how you need to name your objects if you want this bucket to be infinitely deep. It doesn't matter if it's Swift or Ceph or anybody doing object, there's no such thing as an infinitely deep container. And so it's up to you as the developer to create multiple containers. In fact, when you think about it, Swift can have millions of accounts and each account could have millions of containers and we need you to code your application so that it doesn't try to dump everything in just one container. And so there are a couple of different ways to do this. A number of, of applications I work with, so people that do document management systems, they, they're already creating, I give you a document, it's called cat.excel, you know, and it's about all my, my favorite cats. And you put it into the document management system, but you, you rename the file, you put it into a container, and you've gotten in a database that cat.excel equals you know, this, this new name. If you're doing that, it's fine to do what's called a fill and spill. So you decide that you're going to maybe max out at a million objects in a container. And remember, you can always head a container to find out how many objects are in it. And once you hit a certain amount, you create a new one. And a lot of document management systems have this already because they're used to jukeboxing with DVDs and they go, well, once four point, whatever it is, seven gigs of, of storage, is in this, this directory, I'm going to spin off a new um, directory, do the same thing for object storage. Now, if you want to do something where operators or, or end users would actually be able to look in the system, now you need to do categorical. And so categorical is make it intuitive. So if you have a, a log-based system, maybe you create a new container each day with the date. 
and you put all the log files for the day in that. Maybe if you have a video surveillance system, you do the same thing, but you also append a camera name to it. Because again, we can have millions of objects, and it's much easier to clean up a container like that. You wouldn't take a directory and put 100,000 entries into a directory because Windows would not have a good day. And just because we can put 50 million objects in a container doesn't mean you should. Uh, file sync and share, same thing. Certainly build, um, you know, accounts, maybe one for each user, and allow them yep. to, instead of directories, have many containers. Mm -hmm. Or if you have to, have one account and have, mm -hmm. you know, containers for each end user. Yeah, when you can think about the data model and, and sort of lay it out based on something that makes sense, that, that's normally the best way. But you can also use, like, consistent hashing, just like hash use the name, take the first few prefixes. It's uh, just really important for everybody that, you know, we make this scale. Um, here's a quick, uh, yeah. something we ran in the lab. I, th this wasn't on that same um, system. I spun up a couple of instances. So I have millions of entries in a single container down there. And I think this goes up to like 50 million entries. And so what I was doing is I was just testing the, the AC layer. And so I started yeah. off getting a rate of around 300 puts per second mm -hmm. on the database side, right? And as I kept putting more and more objects in it, you can see that the database for the single container started to slow down. And remember that in Swift, every container has its own unique database, which means if you had 10 containers, it would be tenfold the amount of performance. Now, I was using an SSD drive. Certainly, there are, there are environments out there that are running account container, the database, on a spinning drive. And the spinning drive is going to have much worse results here. I mean, we've certainly worked with, with developers who put 100 million you know, objects into a single container on a spinning disk. Mm -hmm. But what you're going to see is this graph keep trending down towards yep. zero. And so at some point in time, mm -hmm. you're only going to be able to do three, four puts per second. Do yourself a, a service right. and shard your... Yeah, the bad thing is the, the biggest containers are normally the ones that are filling up the fastest. Yeah. So you're, like, you're really trying to maintain a high request rate, and uh, uh, you know, you, it's going to drop off after a point. Well, Clay, we are right on time. Are like, we really? I'm sorry so, that I... Uh, if there are any questions, long. hit us right now. And if not, I think they're going to kick us off stage. Feel free to catch us uh, afterwards. Oh, yeah. we have a question. Yeah. Uh, amazing talk, guys. Uh, the concurrent gets is really, really exciting. Um, just wondering what can be done in terms of improving put performance. I know that we only return once all the replicas have been written, right? So is there anything that can be done there to optimize that path? Uh, there, yes. And actually, some stuff is in. We didn't get to talk about all the great stuff that we built in Mataka. Uh, and so, 2.7. Uh, so, uh, one of the things you get, um, we have a post quorum timeout. Uh, you, you don't have to actually have all three replicas return success. You just have to have a quorum of replicas plus a small timeout. You can tune that in. Okay. Essentially, once two of three has responded success, the proxy is going to ultimately respond success. It doesn't absolutely have to wait on that third one to be completed because it already knows it does have enough to indicate success success. Uh, you wait a little bit longer because it helps things appear like more consistent and congealed, but that's a tunable. And so you can bring that guy in if, if, uh, if the final get response on a put request is some latency that you're looking at. Another thing that changed in 2.7, uh, one of the component, one of the jobs that the object server has to do uh, while writes are coming in is maintain some uh, uh, data directory um, data structures that help optimize replication. Uh, it has to invalidate the portion of the namespace that is going to need to be uh, uh, most, most quickly evaluated by the consistency engine. That was in line in the request right along with the F-sync and uh, potentially the, uh, the synchronous container updates. Uh, so you can tune the container updates down. The data structure is actually now a much quicker lockless uh, 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 a, a pinned only file. We just tell it that, hey, the next time that you evaluate this data structure, you also need to apply these uh, changes which have accumulated. Uh, so yeah, put performance I, is I, also something we're working on. Yeah, th so I would say that the biggest thing is if you look back at, and this was in the Liberty release, but we didn't get to talk about it, the async container update. So right now when I write an object, um, it, I need quorum. So if I'm making three copies, two of them have to land on disk and within a reasonable time, two of them have to be updated in the database layer. And so saying that the database, the, the account container asynchronously can be updated is going to allow as soon as it lands on disk for it to come back. Now, depending on your database, like we were just talking about, that could be your bottleneck. If you've got a container of 100 million objects in it, Certainly, decoupling it um, allows even for the database to work more mm -hmm. efficiently in a batch mode. So take those region settings that I gave you mm -hmm. and apply yeah, you know, at least that one, even if you don't have multi-region. Right. Um, the the post-quorum thing, that's off by default? Like it's not, or is that like? 
Uh, it's only controlled by its timeout setting. Okay. Uh, so uh, by yes. default, it may be the case that you observe that generally speaking, that third response happens before the timeout would have kicked it out. Uh, I believe it's, it's something on the order of uh, seconds. Uh, okay. So if you want to bring that in, if you, you really need to return as, you know, as quickly as possible, the async container updates is maybe the first tunable that you look at. The post quorum timeout in the proxy server uh, is going to be the next one that you want to make sure that you're bringing that stuff in as tight as you need it to and be. And the post quorum yeah, timeout. Yeah, we've got the settings the on a number of these slides if you look at them afterwards. And yeah. again, they're all okay. available for download okay. right yeah. now. Um, and then last thing, something I've always wondered about Swift, but I've been too lazy to check myself is between the proxy and, and your storage nodes, does it do any kind of HTTP keep alive style connection pooling, like keeping connections open? Uh, no, most of that we leverage the uh, kernel's TCP stack. There's a number of uh, prescribed TCP tunings um, that, that we want to uh, have those sockets open. I mean, it kind of depends on the cluster layout, how many you know, different guys that you want to be connected to mm -hmm. on different ports. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, we don't. We don't do it. It's, it's, we just tune it down at the uh, socket kernel okay, level. So, so there's, you, no pooling. You, there's some stuff. Well, there's a paper out be from better. Intel on those tunings, especially when you're doing erasure but, but coding. The, network, because the of, network tunings have sort of carried us this far, and it ends up just being a prioritization game of all the other places where we can really make a difference in our application code versus sort of optimizing right, what the Linux kernel can already do. First and then, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, if you hadn't seen those before, or I don't know. I mean, yeah. I guess. I mean, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank you.